Brother Noe says you get in the place now where you start shouting when he announces a song number. <laughs> <laughs> That reminded me of a story of a guy got in the slammer, and the first day in the slammer, they were eating in the mess hall. Some prisoner said 105, and everybody just began to scream, laughing like about to die. And about two minutes later, another prisoner said 57. Everybody just got hysterical again for about five minutes. And a newcomer said, what are they doing? He said, they're calling out jokes. They have the jokes numbered when they give the number of the joke. <laughs> I don't mind the joke, I'll laugh. And he said, well, let me try it. And the guy said, go ahead. So he got up and said, 83. Nobody, you know, not a sound. And he said, what's wrong? The guy next to him said, well, some folks just don't know how to tell a joke. <laughs> I just think, just think what you have missed if you're not there driving them down there tonight, see? I mean, you take these little old buildings you see by the roadside, little brick buildings and cement block buildings and wooden buildings, you never know what's going on in them. You know, Independent Baptist Church is the last place on earth now you can really hear the truth. That's the last place. Because the other, everybody got a chip in their shoulder, and they're all sensitive, and they're just looking for something to get upset about. And now, if you'd stayed home and watched television tonight, uh, you couldn't have got what you got here already. And uh, you sure couldn't get what you're about to hear. I mean, I'd blow every tube in the place, man. I could talk about getting rucked when they tried to get me on the Phil Donahue show. Some of my friends tried to get me on. The lady phoned me up on the telephone, and I could hear the, the recorder buzz in the background, you know, while she was doing it. So I just poured the scripture in there. And I broke that machine all to pieces, man. I mean, that woman was going, just a minute, please. There's something wrong, please. I know what's wrong with the line, please. And but her, I'm sorry, I can't click and hung up, you know. Folks, you have the Phil Donahue show, you know, and tell it, it discusses the issues they really are, you know, and really tells about the, you know, the real nitty gritty of what's going on. No, I don't. No, I don't. You put me in that show, I blow every two in that show in two and a half minutes. Fifteen seconds. By the time it got going good, I'd say, what about you? What do you think about that, that Roman Catholic whore in those seven hills? <laughs> <laughs> Why, the whole thing just come apart the scenes, man. You know, you, you can't hear that kind of stuff in television radio. You're going to hear it right here, or you're never going to hear it. Oh, and I don't have any particular text tonight. I guess that's bad to preach without a text, but I really haven't got one tonight. So I tell them just to turn anywhere, it's all good. <laughs> And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna talk to you tonight about the, about the four essential things in life that a man needs. There are four things that a man needs. Now, you don't want to confuse your need with your greed. I mean, uh, that, that passage that says, my God shall supply your need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus, that does not say, my God shall supply your greed for his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Folks, some folks have a hard time with that verse. And you know, children learn about this easy. I, I don't know how you are about kids. I've got, I've got seven kids and ten grandchildren, and they all, all operate about the same way. When they're about three and four years old, Daddy, we need, we want some ice cream. 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 Then they get to be about five or six, and they start saying, we need some ice cream. You ever notice that? You know what that kid learns? That kid learns that you'll give him what he needs. He learns that real quick. And he learns real quick that he can't get everything he wants. But if mom and daddy love him, they'll give him what he needs. So he switches that thing to work on you. See, it's to brainwash you. And he knows if he says, I want ice cream, I want ice cream, he may not get it. So he says to you, he says, I need, I need, mom and daddy, I need, I need. And that's what we do. We try to kind of force the Lord into it sometimes, you know. It's kind of like a, an old maid said she was about, about 35 years old, hadn't married yet, and she was praying for God to send her husband. And she said, Lord, she says, I need a husband. She said, please send me a husband. said, my, my, uh, my mother needs a son-in-law. <laughs> you kind of put pressure on the Lord about those things. That, 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 that isn't going to work sometime. Now, now, when I talk about need, what you need in this life, I'm sure the first thing you're going to think of is money. But that isn't your first main need. Uh, money's okay, and health's okay. Health's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. The fellow said to lose your... Uh, wealth is much, to lose your health is more, to lose your soul is such a loss that no man can restore. And I don't know how it's been with you, what you've discovered about life in the years you've been alive. I've discovered some things. And if I was going to talk about things in order of importance, I'd say the most important thing in life is being saved. Yeah. And I'd say it's more important than anything. And when it came next to that, I'd say the most important thing in the world was good health. I don't know whether that's so or not, but that, if I was going to say the third most important thing, I'd say it'd be time. If you're good health and got time, you can make the money. 
But if you don't have good health, sometimes you can't make the money. If your time's up, you ain't going to make it no matter what kind of health you have. See, people just don't think. They say, money. No, no, that isn't it. What if you got the money and didn't have the time? What if you had the money and didn't have the health? You couldn't enjoy the money. But I'm going to talk about some basic things tonight, and I call this the four essentials. And by the four essentials, I mean the four things in life that a man has to have or you're going to make a shipwreck of life. You've got to have these four things. Your life's going to be a failure. And you say you're going to be dogmatic about this, Ruckman? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not going to leave any leeway at all when I get through. Before I get through, I'm going to prove my case. Now, the four things a man needs. Now, like I said, the first thing of all that a man needs is salvation. Uh, George Whitfield used to preach all the time. He used to preach, you must be born again. 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 And a man said one time, Brother Whitfield, he said, Brother Whitfield, why do you, every time I hear you preach, you're preaching you must be born again? And he said, because you must be born again. <laughs> That's an imperative. When I talk about must be born again, I'm not talking away about the term is used in modern America. In modern America, the term you must be born again has gotten to be just like the term Christian. It doesn't mean anything. It's nothing. You take a, I profess to be a Christian, but I wouldn't profess it too loudly. You say, well, wow, these days the word Christian means anything. I'm careful with the word Baptist. The word Baptist don't mean much anymore. Back in the old days, it meant something. It don't mean much anymore. Harry Truman was a Baptist man. Jimmy Carter was a Baptist. That ain't my crowd. <laughs> Harry Truman said when he died, he wanted to have on his grave what was put on a tombstone out and out there in Tombstone, Arizona, a grave out there. He said one fellow had a thing out there that said, Here lies so-and-so. He done his D blank, see? That's what Harry wanted on his tomb. Well, I, that's not much of a kind of Baptist for me. I'm even careful about the term fundamentalist. I'm getting kind of leery of that. I mean, everybody in the world professes to be a fundamentalist these days. Uh, I call myself a Bible-believing Baptist. That's what I am. I'm a Baptist, but I'm a certain kind of a Baptist. I'm a Bible-believing Baptist. And folks, aren't you a fundamentalist? Well, I believe the fundamentals, but I'm not a fundamentalist, because a fundamentalist just believes eight or nine things taken out of the book. I don't believe that. I believe the book the things were taken from. Well, so being the virgin birth, the deed of Christ, so does the Pope. Amen. How many people Catholic for you are saved? Let me see your hand. Raise your hands. There's about a fourth congregation. Now, didn't you pop up there and say, I believe you know that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary and suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified and died and was buried and descended to hell and rose again the third day from the dead and descended on the right hand of the Father from whence he cometh to judge? Did you remember saying all that? Amen. You know what those are? Those are the fundamentals. But they're just like they recite them at Bob Jones every morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, I, that ain't me. I believe the book the fundamentals came out of. I'm a Bible believer. All right, now you take salvation. You must be born again. That's an imperative. You weren't asked your opinion about it. He said, you must be born again. You say, well, I don't know whether I will or not. You must. You sound like to be told that. I don't care if you like to be told that or not. You still have to. You must be born again. We got a bunch of people who think they're going to tell God and give God their, you know, their opinion about it. You don't have any opinion about it. You must be born again. That's a, that's, a, that's. It's like the old army, the new army. I don't understand the new army. I was over in Germany and, and went over there in an army mess hall over there. I wouldn't know it was a mess hall. I thought it was a motel. They had a rug on the floor. A rug on the floor in a mess hall. Can you imagine that? And you went by, you know, and they, and they, they had waiters at the table. At the table, they came by and asked you. I didn't believe it, man. Then I went in, you ran your tray down there, and, you know, and the guy slopping the stuff in your tray, and some fellow say, ain't I got any choice, Sergeant? The Sergeant says, sure, you got a choice. You can take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember going overseas in those merchant marine liberty ships and the rocking there in the sea, and guys going the bulkhead and getting, you know, they call it feeding the fishes. And, you know, going across there, that kind of thing, we had a big old black buck downstairs that served up the meals, and the meal, morning meal was mush. Mush. And that guy, he'd take that thing, this is a gross type of thing, you'd lie there to get your breakfast, and as you come by the tray, he'd go, oop, slop, <laughs> hit that thing. Oh, man. <laughs> Guy's just turning green all over the deck. <laughs> Now, you take that kind of a thing right there, that's an entirely different thing, this new army stuff. What would you like? What would you have? I don't understand that. I used to train them in Van Ed. 
My job was called hand to hand. My, I was a DI in hand to hand. My job was to teach fellows how to kill fellows with anything. Tent peg, pencil, and you get your hands on. Your teeth. Teeth are good. Teeth are good. If some guy like Randy White came at me and got a hold of me, you think I'd stand up there and try to box him? Or execute, you know, a flying or something like that? Well, if you kicked him, you'd run your ankle clear through your knee. If a guy came at me like that, I'd just come inside, let him get me, and then get his neck and my teeth and pull out a jugular vein. That's the best way to do it. Twelve seconds. <laughs> Quick. Quick, neat, no problem. <laughs> and that's how we taught them. But I can just I can just imagine this new army teaching bayonet drill. Now, gentlemen, if you don't mind, would you come to the guard position? Thank you. <laughs> and now, if it isn't too much trouble, would you please execute the vertical butt stroke? Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Now listen, that book says it is a point of men wants to die and after the judgment, you don't have any options at all. Any options at all. You shall I think what you think is immaterial. It is a point of men wants to die and after the judgment. You're going to die, you're going to be judged. That's it. The Bible says you must be born again. If you don't want to go to hell, you've got to get born again because your first birth isn't right. And the Bible solution to man's problem is not to... Uh, self-realization or self-evaluation or new styles or humanism or fixing things up or varnish or plastic or plaster of parish, you know, or cellophane or some little uh, shellac job. God says you're born wrong, Amen. and you have to be born over. You must be born again. I think about a case that happened back there in the 1890s someplace where a, a liberal preacher, which is nothing, a liberal preacher was called one time to go down to the worst end of town and deal with a dying heart. He was dying of a VD, and he got down there and took some people down with him, you know, so they wouldn't think he was in the wrong company. And he got down there, that dying woman was screaming and having hallucinations and things, and he tried to comfort her, and she said, but I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. He said, there isn't any hell. She said, there is too, I've seen it. And he said, well, don't worry about it. He said, God wouldn't send him out of hell. She said, he'd send me, he'd send me. And he said, well, uh, 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 keep the Ten Commandments. And she said, I've broken all ten of them. That kind of thing went on there for about 30 minutes and finally got out of there with her still screaming and went on back home and he'd done nothing to help her at all. And when he got back home, he went down there in his office, got in one of the drawers there of his desk and reached way down there and pulled out a little King James Bible he hadn't looked at for about 15 years and began to look at that thing and see what was going on and got saved. That fellow, he discovered he didn't have any answer for people's problems. You say, well, Brother Ruckman, that harlot, you know, dying down there, you know, of a social ease, that is my case, I'm not like that. No, you're like a, you're like a fellow that goes to a doctor, and the doctor says, uh, you got cancer. You say, I don't feel it. Because you may not feel it, but you got it. I mean, you know, it does something done, you've got about, about, uh, three or four months to live here, and you're, you know, it's going to be the end of you. You say, well, I feel all right. The doctor says, I've examined this thing, and you want a second opinion, we can get it, but you've got cancer. You say, but I, I don't feel like I'm dying. And the doctor says, you're dying. Now listen, God says, you're a sinner and you're dying and you need a new birth to get by. You say, I don't feel like it. It's immaterial. The Bible said, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you feel the wrath of God in your head right now? Of course some of you don't. That don't mean it isn't there. If you believe on Christ, it isn't there. If you haven't believed on Christ, it is there. And followed you when you came in, following you go out the door. The fact that you don't feel it's immaterial, if it's there, it's there. Now, the first thing you need is salvation. Matter of fact, if a fellow has salvation, then there's an awful lot of other things he doesn't need. Bob Jones Sr. said that many, many years ago when he was in a, in a meeting, that they were giving testimonies, and people gave a number of testimonies, and finally a fellow there who was 82 years old got to his feet. And he said, that fellow was so feeble and frail, they thought he was going to fall. And a couple of people tried to help him out and stand to his feet, but he pushed them on aside and got to his feet with the help of a cane. And when he stood to his feet, he waited just a minute. His speech was kind of slow. And then he began to talk. And he said, uh, folks, in a kind of a feeble voice, he said, uh, I want to have you know something. He said, I'm 82 years old. 
And I, I was 82 years old last month, and I want you to know I never had very much in life, and, and never had no education, and ne- never had much of anything else. But I've had Jesus Christ, and if a fellow's got him, he don't need much else. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. If you got him, you can get by a lot without a lot of stuff. If Bob Jones said one time he was up there doing personal work, going down a road, and went down a road there, and saw an old couple lady sitting up there on the porch rocking back and forth. He was a young preacher, and was going to stop by there to get a little drink of spring water or something, going down the way he was going. And he came up there and said, that old colored woman, he said, who lives here? And she rocking back and forth on that thing, finding herself with a fan. She said, just me and Jesus, boss, just me and Jesus, just me and Jesus. That's enough. That's enough. I remember I was down in Alabama one time, going back to the woods there and across those plantations there in fields, winning people to Christ and going to these little old shacks, sharecropper shacks back there. I came up the shack and I saw the colored lady. I said, uh, are you saved? She said, uh, yes, sir. She said, I'm saved. I said, well, I'm a preacher. She said, she said, I know you was a soldier to cross when I see you come up to walk. <laughs> and I said, well, have you got any children? She said, yes, sir. I've got, uh, I think it was eight children. She said, I've got eight children. I said, are they saved? She said, yes, they're all saved. And she said, come in here, children, and sing for the preacher. And eight of them came in there. Youngest about five, you know, and oldest about 18. <laughs> And they came there and lined up across from that fireplace, most of them in the bare feet, and she said, Say the Lord's Prayer for the preacher. And they started in unison, and they said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. <laughs> I had that thing down, man. I had that thing down. I had that thing down, boy. I mean, they had it down. I was way back there, I was way back there in those woods and going out around different places. I came in the house there and went in there. The old color woman there, and white hair, she's 110 years old. And I said, are you saved? She said, yes, I sure is. I said, all your children are saved? She said, all them saved but my baby boy right there. I look around the room for a baby boy. There wasn't anybody in that, in that room uh, under 70, I don't guess. <laughs> and she said, my baby boy right there, and her baby boy was something, he was... He must have been 93 years old, standing there with a cane, you know, a little white string beard on. And uh, I got talking about the soul, and she said, yes, she was, she said she was, uh, came over here, and her father was sold into slavery. She was 110 years old in 19, that was 1953. And I got thinking about that thing, you know, about that old colored sister, and I thought to myself, isn't that something? She didn't have glasses. And I had glasses. She still had most of her teeth. She'd never been out of Hill County, just eating tripe and chitlins and possum gravy all her life there in Hill County. I don't guess she'd ever even seen Birmingham. And I left that place, I thought to myself, isn't that something? That sister me going to wind up in the same place, perfect, sinless, just like Jesus Christ. And here I worried myself to death and batted my brains out to get a college education. But half around the world, all this kind of mess going on, we both wind up in the same place. And she just goes along, you know, don't even need glasses. <laughs> wild, man, wild, boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> You know, if you have Jesus Christ, you don't need much else. All right, a man needs to be saved. Now, here's the second thing you need. I mean, we're talking here about essentials. You need assurance. What good is do you be saved if you don't know you're saved? What good do you be saved if you go all through your life worrying about, am I saved or am I not? Am I going to make it or am I not? I went through that stuff in the Catholic Church for years. Never know whether I had it or whether I did. Well, I hope I do. Well, I hope I do. Well, I think I do. Well, I probably do. Well, I'm not sure I do. I, you need to know. You need to know. I was down the street one time preaching out there in Pensacola, Florida, and I was talking with a fellow who called himself an absolutionist, whatever that is. And he talked about this and that and the other thing, and I said, well, uh, are you saved? He said, I don't believe anybody can know they're saved till they die. I said, well, I know I'm saved, and I'm not dead yet. She said, he said, yeah, but you can't know for sure. I said, you calling me a liar? And he said, well, my priest told me you couldn't know. I said, maybe your priest's not as stupid as I am. You ever think about that? And he said, well, nobody can know something for sure. And I said, are you certain? And he said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, man, crazy, crazy. You know, one thing the devil can't stand about that book is that book has absolute knowledge in it. These people go up to college, and they finish college, they come out and they say, well, there's one thing I know, and that's I know nothing. 
and they swell up like that was quite an accomplishment. Isn't that strange? A guy blows $15,000 and says, the only thing I know is I know nothing. Hey, stupid, I could have told you that before you went. Why blow 15000 bucks for that? Amen. You're like these two hillbillies that got in the hospital, never been in the hospital before, and one of them about to have an operation. The nurse came there with a bunch of gadgets and stuff, and the fellow said, what you going to do? She said, I'm going to give an anesthesia. And his buddy said, uh, oh, what's an anesthesia? And the lady about to give this other friend of his anesthesia said, well, we're going to have an operation. We'll give this thing to him there, you know, and he won't know anything. And he said, lady, you don't have to give that to Bill. He don't know nothing now. <laughs> Now, do you know, do you know you're saved? That book says, we know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. Hereby we know we know him by a spirit that he hath given us. We know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. These things that were written, you'll be the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. Amen. Somebody says, don't you think that's presumptuous? It'd be presumptuous for me to say I didn't know. If I told you I didn't know I was saved, I'd be presuming, I'd be tempting God to kill me. You know why? Because God told me in the book I was saved. Now, well, I'm going to make a lie out of it. I suppose I tell my boy, I said, I got a 50 cent change here, I want to have you keep, keep it for me. And he had it up in his pocket, and a relative come in and said, did your dad give you any money? My boy said, yes. And he said, how much was it? And my boy says, well, I don't know. And the man said, well, how much did he say it was? And my boy said, well, you know, he said it was 50 cents, but you know my dad. <laughs> See? I mean, that Bible said, He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar. I'd presume if I told you I wasn't saved, that's presumption. The Lord said, If I'd believe on his son, he'd save me. I believe in his son. He said, Who struck a call upon the name of the Lord should be saved? I called on him. He said, Him that cometh to me, I don't know why I was cast out. I came to him. Now, he says, I give to my sheep eternal life the gift of God. As many as received him, I received him. I don't know I can do to be saved. I know I'm saved because God says I'm saved. A fellow said to me one time, he said, you ever doubt your salvation? And I told him, yeah, I doubt my salvation. I doubt my salvation about, uh, oh, about twice a year for about uh, 15 seconds, something like that. And he said, well, how do you handle that thing comes? Well, I don't argue with the devil. Some of you get an argument with the devil. The devil comes around to you and says, well, when you believe, did you really believe? Did you really repent? How'd you know you trust? Can you trust your faith? Can you trust your belief? Maybe your belief in your belief wasn't real belief. <laughs> and then he starts saying, Don't, aren't you still doing this? And have you quit this? And didn't you quit this and start to do that? And the first thing you know, you fool, you're so bound what you're doing that you forget you weren't saved by what you were doing anyway. Amen. Devil comes around to me and starts that stuff on me and says, you're lost. I say, okay, I'm having a good time. Get off my back. <laughs> That's right. If I'm lost, I sure am enjoying the trip home. You say, if you're lost, you ought to get saved. I've been saved. You say, how do you know it? I've done all I could do to get saved. You want to catch me busting my neck trying to get saved? I've already done all a man can do to get saved. If I don't work, I'm going to hell. Bye-bye. <laughs> I know what that book says. That book says, if I count on the finished work of Jesus Christ to save my soul, that'll do it. Yes. Now, if that don't do it, I'm just good in hell with the door shut and the key thrown away. So I sweat it out, man. <laughs> the thing, you see this thing right here? Now, you see that? You know what religion is? It's reliance. I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm counting on a thing to hold me up. Now, if I don't hold me up, I'll tell you one thing for sure. I'm not going to fall that way. <laughs> You see, I got all my weight on that thing. Now, you know what I'm counting on keeping me out of hell and out of the lake of fire? Well, it's not my ministry, and it's not my good life, and it's not my baptism, it's not my church membership. I'm counting on what Jesus Christ did for me. So if it doesn't work, see you in hell. <laughs> Amen. Some of you got the funniest look on your face. You know... You know you know, you got the devil got you last round trying to figure out what you can do. You can't do nothing. Too late, man. By grace you're saved through faith, not not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, not of works, not of works, not of works, as any man should boast. The devil ain't going to drive me up a stump of that stuff. You need to know you're saved. 
You take all this, all this modern stuff, you know, science, you're going to discover this, and you're the new breakthrough, you know, this uh, great uh, scientific breakthrough. Science, all it, all it does is raise more questions. Science never solve anything. You can't think of one thing science ever solved. You say, well, I got this disease fixed. You haven't got that disease fixed, God, God got another one to kill you. When you get that one fixed, he'll get you another one to kill you. Going to get to the moon, you're not going to be satisfied with the moon, and nothing up there, you're going to go a little further. You know what you find when you get a little further? More problems. <laughs> what you need to do is you need to get saved, you need to know you're saved, and why well, it's all these people sweating out this atom bomb, this nuclear bomb, all this stuff, if people just in a sweat, just worried to death, why, what, what's there to worry about if you know where you're going when you die? You're going to die anyway. Would you rather die in a hospital 11 months paying bills or get blown all the smithereens at one time? I don't care about it. Let her rip. Let her rip. Let her rip. You get talking like that, people say, oh, those, those fundamentalists, those radical, fanatical. You just say that because you ain't got a lick of sense. That's your problem. Um, you haven't sat down and thought that thing out. If you have assurance, know where you're going when you die, that that, not that much is settled, you're going to die anyway. These poor, dumb, unsaved people, they think the problem's war. If we could just stop wars, if we could just stop wars. Listen, man, if you could stop wars, you'd die anyway. Because the way the sin is death, the problem ain't war, the problem is kicking the bucket. That's the problem. <laughs> and Christ said, if a man lives and believes on me, he won't die, and though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. That's what you want. That's what you want. Amen. Now, you know that, you know that story about that king who was dying. He had a jester, and he said to his jester, he said him out around the world, he said, the old fool, he said, you're the biggest fool I ever saw in my life. And he said, I want to have you take my scepter and go out around this world and travel up and down. And when you find a fool that's a bigger fool than you are, I want you to get my scepter. And as the story goes, the fool went out and traveled around the earth for a couple of years and came back, and he still had the scepter. And the king said, couldn't you find a bigger fool than yourself? He said, no, I couldn't. And then he said to the king, he said, what's the matter, majesty? You look kind of pale. And the king said, well, he said, I'm about to take a long trip. And the jester said, where are you going? And he said, I don't know where I'm going. And the jester said, when are you leaving? And he said, I don't know when I'm leaving. And he said, uh, what preparations have you made to go? And he said, I haven't made any preparations to go. And the jester handed him a scepter back and said, Old King, you're the biggest fool I ever met in my life. Well, now let's just face it. You're going to take a trip. You may not take it tonight, but you're going to take it pretty soon. You never know when you're going to take it. Do you know where you're going? Well, if you don't, what are you sitting there acting intelligent for? <laughs> You try to fool me and make me think you've got a brain in your head? What are you sitting there trying to tell me because you've been to college, you know, and can fill out an income tax report, you got any sense? If you had any sense, you'd prepare to take the trip because you're going to take it. Aren't people strange? I mean, they get car insurance, life insurance, liability, you know, and fire insurance, you know, and uh, Red Cross, Blue Cross, and Double Cross and all that mess. They got that stuff right there. You know what they're doing? They're preparing, preparing, preparing in the case of, in the case of, in the case of. What are you doing about dying? You're all going to do that. I mean, maybe your house won't burn down. Maybe you won't spend a whole lot of time in the hospital. You might, but maybe you won't. I'll tell you one thing you do for sure. No way of saying the buts about it. You'll die. What preparation you made to go? All right, now, you see, these things are essential. Here's the next one. You might not uh, just uh, get, guess what this is offhand, but this is comfort. You say, what's comfort? Just what it says. Our job as preachers is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's our job. And God comforts us not so we can be comfortable. God comforts us so we can comfort others. And you take that thing right there. Did you know if a man has comfort, he can get through an awful lot? And without comfort, you know, there's some things you just can't get through. You're going to make a shipwreck of things. You're going to make the biggest mess you ever saw. You say, well, I'm, you know, I'm tough and I can take it. Well, you can take something and something else you can't. I know how that goes. You know, you know where they are tonight up and down this country? I mean, uh, in BFW halls up and down this country. Old the war veterans sitting around and crying their beer and crying their wine and talking to each other. And old buddy, I remember old buddy, you remember old so-and-so? You remember old so-and-so? They're all sitting around feeling sorry for themselves. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to get comfort. 
You know, a guy laced that stuff with PCP in that business, you know, and pops. You know, you know why a guy does that? Because he's miserable. He's trying to get comfort. That's why people drink. That's why they take dope. Listen, if you don't have any comfort when the hour of crisis comes, you blow it. You make the biggest mess you ever saw. I don't care how big you are, how tough you are. There's many a man in jail tonight, many a man to slammer tonight, just as hard as nails, boy. And when he goes to bed at that night, he lays down on that old iron bunk and grabs all those iron bars with his hands up above his head and where nobody can hear him. I mean, he wouldn't want to have his buddies, you know, know what a softer he was. And when nobody can hear him, that fellow's grabbing hold of those things and he's saying, Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did it. If you just get me out, if you just get me out, I'll never do it again. God, if you just get me out. <laughs> yeah, he just don't anybody know about it. I don't care how tough you are. I've seen this. I've seen the army go through 32 months of combat. 32 months. Three months of combat's a long time. I mean, I've known guys who went through the North Africa invasion, they went through Sicily, and then landed Anzio, and they hit the southern belly of France, and came up across the Rhineland. 32 months of it. And got by for a while. I mean, old cussing, godless, old depraved instrument, lowest class people in the world, the roughest, meanest, and got through okay, and then somewhere... Coming through there, like a friend of mine named Marshan did, he killed a German and took his bill forward, took his pistol and got his watch and everything. That's just standard procedure. I mean, he can't use them anymore. And picked him up, you know, and made the mistake of getting his wallet, you know, and opened up and looked at the pictures. And saw the guy's wife and saw the guy's kids. Slapped that thing up. He's never any good again. He started drinking and drank all the way through Germany and drank way back to the States. Then got kicked out of the service five years for retirement. Went back up North Carolina and stayed drunk the rest of his life. Just hard as nails. But he needed some comfort. And he didn't have any comfort. I met a fellow Christ one time down in Bay Minette, Alabama. Well, Alberta, Alabama it was. His name was Russell Fell. And Russell Fell was a good combat man as you've ever seen in your life. He's a Roman Catholic, lost, cussing, you know, catting around, whoremonger, just typical instrument. And that old boy went through about something like about eight months of combat. And during a barrage, when he shelled a fly over the place, and that man would scream, you know, they call for the mothers, and they don't have any comfort. If you don't have any God to call upon, they call for the mothers. Those things start coming there. <laughs> mama, mama, mother, mother. I mean, six feet two, boy, six feet three. Raise a hand in your head. Now, one of those barrages, when they, he came up out of the foxhole, the second lieutenant got up right beside him. We've been in the foxhole right next to him. Uh, for cover during the barrage, and that lieutenant got up. When he got up, he was screaming at at, uh, at uh, Fell, Russell Fell, this friend of mine, and pointing down to his hole and saying, I found God, Russell, I found God, I found God right down that hole. <laughs> he got saved, you know, down the hole. <laughs> and old Russell Fell said, oh, you can shake and find him any time. Went on in the act, act, you know, that kind of fella. Hard man. Came up over a ridge. Toward the end, you know, those that survive get thinking they're invulnerable. You can't blame them after they've been through about five or six actions. And so he comes up over a hill, skylighted on the skyline where he shouldn't have been. Some German took a grease gun, a schmizer, and stitched him up, hit him five times. And every one of them was a flesh wound. I'm through the combat boot, behind the thing, and behind the, the, the thigh, and one went through his canteen, one hit his cartridge belt, one under the arm, just bleeding like a stuck hog, like he just dumped him and catch it. And he went back to the aid station walking, and got back to the aid station, the aid station fellow, the G.I. looked up and said, you know what the blank is blank do you want? And Russell said, uh, he said, I need first aid. <laughs> the G.I. looked up and said, you don't need a first aid, man. You need a mattress cover. That's what they buried him in, you know. And he said, look at yourself. And Russell hadn't looked till then. He'd just been walking. And he turned around and looked at that thing and fainted. I mean, just dropped. <laughs> now, he went through all that and never got saved. You know what happened to that fellow? He came back to the States, an unsaved man, settled down there in Alberta, Alabama, and I had a meeting down there, a little old German church, first church of Alberta, pastor of the German, spoke German, the name was Potzner. That's a German settlement down there. And one night, in the middle of that meeting, out comes Russell, fell to the meeting, heard me one time, down the aisle came, he got saved. And I was talking to him after the thing was over, and I said, a guy like you, what in the world got a hold of you? And he was crying. He said, my little boy, my little boy, his little four-year-old boy got pneumonia. And that broke him, just busted him in two. I'm telling you, there'll come a time in your life when if you don't have the Holy Spirit to comfort you and the nearness of God to get you through, 
you're not getting through in any kind of shape. And I don't care how much moolah you got, buddy. I don't care if your house looks like the Taj Mahal. You ain't getting through. You know why? That's essential. You've got to have that. You've got to have that before you get money. You can't always buy comfort with money. A man needs comfort. Years ago, the famous preacher, D. Whit Talmadge, was going down the battery in New York. That's along the wharf there. And he was going out there to get sermon material to preach. He was a realist. He was. And he got going through there and went up down there. with was a police escort at night. One night, and they're walking down the wharf on a cold, winter, bitter January night. They found a little girl, about 12 years old, sitting up on some pilings up there and wrapped up in an old blanket, just shivering all by herself. And they took her off the pilot and tried to get, get back to the police station. They said, honey, what are you doing out here? And she said, I'm waiting for somebody to come along and take care of me. And they said, well, honey, what makes you think anybody come along and take care of you? And she said, well, I don't know. She said, my mother died two nights ago, name a certain place, a garage near there. And she said, uh, my mother's all I had. My mother told me right before she died. She said, honey, I don't know what's going to happen, but somebody will take care of you. Somebody will take care of you. And folks say, well, that's all melodramatic. Uh-huh, yeah. But I'll tell you, that's a picture of the human soul. That's a picture of the human soul. You need somebody to take care of you. And I'll tell you, friends will betray you sometimes, and the family won't stand by you. And if that weren't enough, sometime when the family does stand by you, you're going to go through things and sorrows and troubles yourself where your family can't, uh, they can't taste it for you. You'll have to have somebody go through it with you. And you've got to have comfort. Now, folks, I'm talking about essentials. I hope you all get rich. I mean it. I know no, nothing sarcastic. I hope every Christian in this building just gets as rich as Croesus. I hope you get enough money, you could hire a man like Henry Ford to pay your fingernails and Getty to drive your car for you and hire Hughes, you know, to clean your dishes. I hope you make millions of dollars, honest to God. I get so sick and tired of all the unsaved people having the money and God's people not having it. If, 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 I, if somebody gave me a million dollars, I'd get rid of it in two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Wouldn't take me two weeks to get rid of it. I'd take everyone out check, our missionaries, write them out a check for $20,000. Just like that, boy. Poor Uncle Sam got a penny of it. I hope you, I, I hope you get filthy rich and all that kind of thing, but, uh, it isn't essential. It isn't essential. You can get by without the money, but you can't get by without the comfort. You gotta have comfort. That thing is a, an absolute essential. You take, uh, John Bunyan. You know what that fella did? He spent 12 years in prison, Bedford Prison. He spent 12 years in prison. They come around and tempt him to get out and say, John, if you'll just go to the bishop for a license to preach, got to get a license, John. You got a license, John. <laughs> and if you just go to that bishop and get a license to preach, we'll let you out. And old John said, if I stay in, I'll stay in this prison until the moss grows on my eyebrows. And he stayed. They fed him on what they call Blue John. Blue John is clabbered, clabbered buttermilk that turns kind of blue. And he wrote in a little piece of paper, he wrote in a little piece of paper that he saved from wrapping some things, and he only could write about two hours a day when he had enough light. He said, I'm drawing here, I'm drawing a muckraker. This fellow's looking for something in the garbage can. And they stand behind him, one who offers him a crown, and he won't turn around and see who it is. That's what that business is. John Bunyan wrote about that. And John Bunyan was in that jail, you know what John Bunyan had? He had him a little twelve year old girl who was blind. And those dirty rascals used to have him and his wife, John Bunyan's wife, come to the prison and bring that little twelve year old girl with her, and she'd stand there and beg him to, to come out, come home and see me and mama. <clears throat> I don't know if I could take that or not. He took it for twelve years. He never surrendered. When he got out, he preached. You know what John had that some of you don't have? You know what he had that you're going to need? He had a comforter. He had a comforter. He couldn't have done it without it. You can't go through that kind of thing unless you've got somebody there with you helping you out. And Christ said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. He said, if I go away, I'm going to send a comforter. You've got to have comfort. Oh, now the last thing you're going to need, and I'm talking you understand about essential. You say, has money come yet? No, it don't come yet. <laughs> but one more. You gotta have wisdom. You say, why? Because if you have wisdom, you lose your money anyway. If you don't have wisdom, you lose your money anyway. I mean, if you got wisdom, you can get the money. 
But if you haven't got wisdom, you can't keep the money you got. You take Solomon, he said, after I did all this work here and I die, how do I know whether they're going to leave it to a wise man or to a fool? Well, you don't know. You know, you know what you need? You need wisdom. There isn't a time, there isn't a time in the world you need more wisdom, I'd say, than this age in which we live in. We live in the craziest, kookiest age the world's ever seen. As far as America's concerned, it's the craziest bunch of, why, why, if you went along this age and believe what they believe and talk like they talk and thought what they thought, you'd be, you'd be ready for the nut house. The, the crazy, nothing makes any sense. Is anybody here tonight who would care to explain our foreign policy? <laughs> why, nobody understands it. Is anybody here that could stand up and tell me how fine integration has worked out for any city in America? Take any city, for example. I don't care. Pick one out of 50. You crazy age, boy. It's a wild age. It's a fast age. You ever stop thinking about this stand sitting here right now? You know there are animals going over your head that never came down? They put animals up in some of those capsules, and they never came down. They're still up there. I don't know they're dead or not. That's a startling thought. Maybe there's a live dog going over your head once every 24 hours. <laughs> It's a wild age, boy. Wild. I mean, a fellow said it's a wild age. No, he said, just think of it. He said, well, a wild age it is. He said, you can, you can uh, get, eat your breakfast in New York and eat your dinner in Chicago and eat your supper in Los Angeles and pick up your bags in London. <laughs> it's wild. It's a crazy age. Then that was an age when you eat wisdom like this age here. You know what wisdom is? I've had a long time to think about these things. I don't just say them off the cuff. Uh, you know what wisdom is? Wisdom is knowing when to be afraid. I got that thing figured out. My Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know what wisdom is? It's knowing what to be scared of, what not to be scared of. A man that's wise is scared when he's supposed to be scared, and he ain't scared when he's not supposed to be scared. And a fellow who has no wisdom is always scared to death about something that don't amount to hill of beans, and then isn't afraid about what he ought to be afraid about. That's what it is. It's wisdom. It's knowing when to be afraid and when not to be afraid. Why, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wild age. It's a wild age, and you're going to need wisdom. Crazy age. People popping pills. I want to see the day when a guy gets up in the morning and throws down his antihistamine pills and throws down his anti-allergic pills and then throws his uh, heart pill in there and then his diet pill and then his vitamin pill and then lights a cigarette and explodes. <laughs> Boom! You know. It's a wild it's a wild, crazy age, man. And you're going to need wisdom to get through it. You take, why, you know, you know Americans are crazy. Oh, remember that Vietnam, that war in Vietnam? You know what that is from a military standpoint? I don't have to go to the, the a, a war college or West Point to know what, what was wrong with that war. I mean, I'm just an old shave tail, but I came from an army family. Been on, they've been field officers, line officers for four generations. Let me tell you something, man. I mean, just as a military expert who knows more than anybody in the Pentagon, when you're outflanked and encircled and infiltrated, you're whipped. <laughs> Can't you figure that out? You ever look at a map of Vietnam? They got you on the flanks, they got you encircled, and they're inside your ranks. You're through <laughs> to repart with a respectable victory. you out of your mind. Why, Ho Chi Minh said up there, you get out, we'll give you back to the prisoners. You get out, we'll give you back to the prisoners. We're saying, you give us the prisoners, we'll get out. You give us the prisoners, we'll get out. You know who won? Ho Chi Minh. We got out, and we didn't get the prisoners back after we got out. Somebody's stupid. Somebody hadn't got, any, hadn't got a brain in their head talking about victory when you're outflanked and encircled. Come on. Put you up here tonight. Suppose you are a karate expert. It puts you up here tonight, it put one guy over here with a 38, one guy here with a 45, one guy behind you with a knife, a guy back here with an electric buzzsaw, a gasoline chainsaw, and you're in the middle, and then you have a temperature of 104, and have an attack of appendicitis, he says, get him! <laughs> you're a dead duck. You're not just in circle, you're infiltrated, the enemy's inside. You're not going to win, no way in the world, I've gone earth to win. It's a crazy age. I heard a, a broadcast from Dayton, Ohio, a couple of years back, and it said we ought to change the Constitution and all the 27th Amendment. So it, the 27th Amendment reads, we believe that men and women are all created equal. You know, ERA, you know. 
Eve ruined Adam and all that kind of thing. And they're trying to get that thing going, trying to say all the same, and it says, we should do this because now our conscience has been awakened. You know what that same bunch of crackpots was doing? They were debating whether or not to take the names off the restrooms in the public places. Conscience awakened. Crazy, man. You've got you to gotta have the wisdom of, of Solomon to get through this age, man. It's Cookville. 24 hours a day. I was down there at Pensacola Junior College, and they were down there. You know what they were debating? Serious. Just as serious a heart attack. They were standing up there and talking about where to take the names off the restrooms. So when you go in a restroom, it doesn't say gentlemen or ladies or men and women. I guess it just says it <laughs> or things. And they were up there talking about that thing just like they had good sense, you know. I mean, presenting pro and con. And I sat there and marveled. I sat there and marveled. I said to myself, every one of those fellows must have been to college. <laughs> you, you, couldn't, you couldn't be that stupid unless you went to college. That's right, brother. Nobody on this earth is born that dumb. You've got to be taught to be that dumb man. While age, you know what you have to have? You have to have wisdom. The Bible said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives liberty all the men, and braideth not. Let him ask, and it shall be given him. Now, wisdom is an innate thing. It's a thing you get inside. It's a thing you can't learn. You don't learn wisdom at school. You learn knowledge at school, but you don't, or don't learn wisdom. Your pastor and I, uh, we both knew Bob Jones Sr. real well when he was in his prime. And that fellow was one of the wisest men that ever lived. That fellow was raised a peanut farmer in southeast Alabama, but that old boy had wisdom. Now, I'll show you the kind of wisdom he had. When he was about 10 years old, he was preaching the place. He was a boy preacher when he was 10. And he came out of the place Sunday morning, and he wanted to uh, get something to eat. He was, he was hungry. And his mother and dad were both gone at that time, and nobody was at home. So he waited around out in front of the church, hoping somebody would ask him to come and eat with them. And the crowd thinned out, and the people went home, and nobody asked him to come home and eat with them. And he began to get real hungry. So he stopped the guy there and said, uh, Hey, he said, would you like to come over to my house for dinner? And the fellow said, uh, Sure, Bobby, where do you live? He said, About five miles down the road. And the fellow said, well, I live about a mile down the road. Why don't you come home with me? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, you won't learn that in school. You won't learn that in school. Back in World War I, was an Irishman over there in the British Army overseas, and his wife was at home with four or five children, had nobody to dig the potato patch for them and plant the potatoes and worry about starving. And she write to him in desperation about it. And he wrote a letter to his wife and said, uh, Dear so-and-so, he said, Try to plant the potato somewhere else this year because I hit all the guns in the garden. <laughs> and he knew the letter would be censored. He knew it would be looked at. And boy, when they saw that letter, the constabulary came into his wife's place and dug that garden up, man, three feet deep all over the place. And he said, okay, plant the potatoes. <laughs> now, now, now see, now see, <laughs> you know what that is? That's wisdom. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And now, you know something, if you got that, you can get the money. Well, he got that. If he doesn't have that, he can't get the money anywhere. It takes wisdom. It takes, uh, takes understanding. Sometimes, you know, a fellow thinks he's smart when he's not. Like one fellow one time, he, people kept stealing his watermelons out of his watermelon patch. So he get a cap, found a capital ID, and he put a sign out there and said, one of these watermelons is poisoned. And the next day he got up and found a sign out there and said, two of these watermelons are poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have wisdom. The Bible says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth liberty to all men, and abradeth not. Let him ask, he says, and it shall be given him. Like I say, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing age, and, and you need wisdom. It's a high sound and high talking age, and they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what in the world they're doing. I was, on a, I was on a radio broadcast over there in San Antonio a couple of weeks back discussing evolution, and a guy phoned up there strutting his stuff, and he said, Well, I'm a teleological pantheist. Oh, boy. <laughs> a teleological pantheist. Well, you know, cut off my legs and call me shorty. What is a teleological pantheist? <laughs> you know, a guy says something like that to impress folks. You know what a teleological pantheist is? That's an idolater. That's a guy who thinks God's in everything, pantheism, so every inanimate object has a design built inside it. It's teleological, see? They use a big word to try to mess you up. That's the oldest form of paganism in the world. 
you get a book on the psychology of religion, that religion is called animism. It's a teaching there's a spirit residing in brick and wood and stone. That's why idolaters worship them. That guy was a Ph.D. from college. What a fool. What a fool. I'm a teleological pantheist. <laughs> You're a dolly worshiper, fella. <laughs> All this stuff. You know, wisdom, wisdom is a thing you can't, that can't be learned. Wisdom is something that comes from God. I think about uh, Criswell, and Criswell and a friend of mine named E.C. Sheehan from Macon, Georgia, Southern Baptist preacher, both of them Southern Baptists. And they had a big old Southern Baptist meeting in uh, Macon, Georgia, and all the convention was there, and they're having a big time, and passing the motion, and Michelle with the motion, and double the motion, the secretary, the honor, the treasure, all that mess. And, and E.C. Sheehan and uh, Criswell got tired of it. They wanted to hear some good preaching. So Criswell said, listen, he said, I know where the colored church down here, they have a big revival, now let's slip off from this convention and go down here and preach. So they went down there. There was a church here about, oh, about this size right here, maybe a little bit smaller, and it must have about 800 colored folks in it. Just packed and jammed. And there wasn't any room for Criswell and, and Sheehan, so they went to a window. There was an open window over here to the side of the pulpit, and they got there leaning the window to, to watch. And the evangelist got up there and sat down, and he had on his white gloves, and he took off his white gloves and took a matchbox out of his pocket and got a match out of there and cleaned his ears, <laughs> put the match back in the box, and put it back in his shirt, and he got up to preach. He got up there to preach, and he opened his Bible. He said, now, before I begin to preach tonight, I want to ask you all a question. And he turned to the preacher and said, preacher, pastor, he said, uh, could you answer me this question? He said, where was the Lord before he made the heaven and the earth? My pastor scratched his head and said, uh, mm -mm. I don't know. He turned to the choir director and he said, uh, choir director, where was the Lord before he made the heaven and the earth? The choir director said, mm -mm, I don't know. He turned that choir. He said, choir, where was the Lord before he made the heaven and the earth? About a hundred of those old darkies said, mm -mm, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turned that congregation. About 800 folks said, congregation. He said, where was the Lord before he made the heaven and the earth? And all 800 of those people together said, mm, mm, we don't know. <laughs> and then he turned to Criswell, who had a Ph.D. and a Ph.D. from Dallas, and he said, white man down the window. So down the window, white man, tell me something. Where was the Lord before he made the heaven and the earth? And old Criswell leaned out the window, and he said, mm, mm, I don't know. <laughs> And that old color preacher said, well, he was in his glory, that's where he was. And Criswell said, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what that is? That's wisdom. That's something upstairs. You've got to have these four. Now, good health, that's great. That's fine. I hope you're blessed with good health. But you don't have to have it. Good health, folks, is a luxury. It's not a necessity. It's a luxury. There have been people that underwent and underwent the tortures of the dam with physical infirmities all their life and trouble and pain that got through and lived happy, glorious, successful, fruitful lives and were a blessing to thousands. It's possible not to have good health and still be a success in life from God's standpoint. It's possible not to have the money, but it's not possible without them things there. That's absolutely essential. Years ago, they lived in, uh, in England, a fellow named Harry Lauder. I say he lived in England, he was a Scotch comedian, actually, and he had a thick Scotch brogue like James McGinley. And he was the, he was the Bob Hope of World War I, except Harry Lauder's jokes were clean. And Harry Lauder entertained the troops overseas in World War I and spoke to the officers' groups and enlisted men and things like, you know, like Bob Hope does. And Harry Lauder, while he was over there, up near the front line, got a, a tele, telegram from the front saying his only boy, John, had been killed in action. And right before he got the telegram and he was in his tent putting on his makeup and getting ready to go out there and entertain the troops and put on a show for them, act like a clown, get them laughing. And he got that telegram and he sat there in his tent for about 30 minutes was late coming to the officer's place to entertain him. And when he came in, his face was all puffed and red and swollen, been crying. And of course, they thought it was part of the act, you know. This was part of the joke, this big joke, you know. They were all punching each other and sticking and laughing when he came in. But the more he talked, the quieter they got. 
And Harold Lauder said this. He said, uh, gentlemen, he said, I just got a telegram from the front. And he said, it says my only son John was killed in action. And he said, when I got that telegram, he said, I sat down there on my bunk, and I said to myself, well, howdy, old boy, there's just one of three things you can do. There are three roads you can take. You can take the road to suicide and take your 45 here and blow your brains out. Or you can take the road to drunkenness, get on the bottle and stay on the bottle. Or you can take the road to Calvary like you should have taken a long time ago. Got on his knees by the bunk and got saved. Brother had some sense. If you're not going to say, no, I, I get quoted for all kinds of things. Let's go and tape like anything else. I'll stand by it. If you're not going to get saved, get drunk and stay drunk. Amen, amen. Told us I blow my brains out. You haven't got any brains to blow out. <laughs> a man, a man that's sober and unsaved and won't accept Christ doesn't have any purpose for living at all. You might just well get stoned and stay stoned. Amen. And the reason why more unsaved people aren't stoned is because they don't have any brains. If they had any brain, they could figure this thing out. But nothing to life, or nothing to death, but just dying and going to hell. What's the sense in the thing anyway? You ought to get right. Let's stand. Let's stand. I want to have our song leader come and lead us an invitation to him tonight. And let's sing, Just I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That thy bids me come to the old Lamb of God I come. And some of you tonight, how about taking the road to Calvary, okay? We've got men and women here that can lead you to Christ. You've got an old-fashioned altar here where you can kneel. Nobody here at this church going to make merchandise out of you. I know Brother Noah. I know him real well. I had him down to my church here a month or so ago at a meeting, and I've known him for nine, ten years. He's not going to try to slip you into church or slip you into a baptismal pool before you get saved. Nobody here is going to try to do anything with you except just lead you to Christ. Now, how many of you men here tonight know how to lead a soul to Christ? Can I see your hands? Hold your hand high up. Keep them up real high. Now, keep them up this minute. If you're a man here tonight, I want you to look at those hands. Now, where you stand tonight, I want to have you look at those hands. You know what those hands are? Those hands are any fellow with his hand up can lead you to Christ tonight before you get out that door. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, let me ask you ladies. How many of you ladies know how to lead a soul to Christ? Let me see your hands. Hold them up high, ladies. Way up. Keep them up a minute. Now, if you're a woman here tonight, you've got any doubts about what you're supposed to do here tonight, you look at those hands. Any one of those women is perfectly qualified. To lead. You don't need a priest. You don't need a nun. You don't need a cardinal. You don't need a bishop. There, there are thousands of ordinary Christians know how to lead you to Christ, and they'd, they'd love to do it tonight. There's an aura here. Come on down while we sing, and kneel there for a word of prayer, and one of these ladies, one of these men will kneel with you, and Show you how you can know, how you can know you say. All right, let's sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood. Just as I am and waiting not. Sent me down home a couple of weeks back. I thought I'm asking this before. They say if they come to get you, are you going to submit and turn the other cheek, let them carry you off to jail or the medal of war, or are you going to fight? I ask a question like that. You know, it takes a lot of wisdom to know what to do in this country, where this country is going. They start trying to shut down the churches like they've shut down schools. In this country, people listen to this country 40 years ago, there were five cases on the docket of arguments about separation of church and state. There were five cases. Right now, there are over 1,500. 1,500. 
It's going to take the wisdom of God to get to the next year. You're going to be, those up are saved going to have a hard enough time of it. You unsaved people, you're going to get a knocked around like a ball bearing and a pinball machine. If I you, I'd get saved. I told those fellows, if I had a chance to fight, I'd fight. I mean, they might get me up on the sly, you know, come around two o'clock in the morning, haul you off to the, shoot you full of pills and stuff where you know what you're doing, and you have a chance. They might get you that way, I don't know. But I tell them, if I have a chance to shoot, I will shoot. I will shoot. You said, on what ground? I'm protecting my family. My family, bless God. I'm the head of my family, depend upon me. Nobody has the right to take me from them, except the Lord. So if I had a chance, I'll shoot. I don't like violence. Give me talk about it, a lot about it, because I'm so used to it, you know, I'm just kind of adjusted to it. But I know I don't want to trip to the emergency ward in the hospital. I don't want to cut anybody up and have them bleeding like a stuck hog. I, I, don't, I don't enjoy that kind of stuff. I'm saved. All that stuff behind me. But if I had a chance to fight back, I'd sure do it. You can count on me. You swear to get that from, I ask God for wisdom. I don't want to start nothing too soon. You've got to get your timing right. And it's like wisdom to get your timing right. You folks have money, a stock market up and down, back and forth, and it's going to take, going to take wisdom. One of these days, he's going to pull a rug out from under you and give you $10 back in a hundred. And slip you the pink, the pink chips and the yellow chips. And it may delay, it may delay, but it'll come. You know what it'll take when that time comes? It'll take wisdom to know what to do and how to do it and when to do it. And if you haven't got it, you go down. Listen, in Christ, Colossians, are found all the wisdom of God, in whom are the riches of the wisdom of God, the fullness of God bodily. The wisdom is in Jesus Christ. You have him, you can get the wisdom. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Let's pray a while tonight. Now, I'm not going to have a long invitation. We're going to sing about two more standards. Then we're going to close. But let's pray a little while tonight. I'm sure there's someone to say people here tonight. How many of you, how many of you Christians, is there a Christian here tonight who knows of an unsaved person that's here? Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? There's one. There's two. There's three. There's four. There are four Christians here, at least a minimum. Some of you might not raise your hand, but there are four that admitted they knew of an unsaved person here. So there's bound to be one. And if four people raise their hand, there's probably four. And you ought to come tonight and trust Christ. Well, the personal work is ready here to meet you down at the front, preachers. Brother Noah, meet with you. Have a word of prayer with you and get it fixed tonight. Why don't you come? Let's wait just a few minutes before we sing the final stand. Then we're going to close. Right now, while we tarry, will you come? Will you step out? By your coming, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. I did the 14th of March, 1949. I've never regretted it a day since. Not a day since ever regretted it. If you want to come, come on. Don't, don't worry about what to do. Just come on. We'll take care of you. We're here to help you. Nobody here is going to take advantage of you. Nobody's going to try to slip you in, you know, something you shouldn't get in. Step out and come on. Give it a try. Christ said if you'd come to him, he wouldn't turn you down. You want to come on? Come on. See what he'll do for you. Try him out. Say, Lord, you said if I'd come, you'd take me. I'm coming. And see if he takes you. You say, Lord, you said if you'd, I'd believe, you'd give me eternal life. I'm believing. Now you do your part. He'll do it. Head bowed, left softly, saying, Just as I am, thou wilt receive, with welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Let's sing that standard. Just as thou wilt receive. Will you receive him? You will receive him? Come on, step out. You receive him, he'll receive you. You take him, he'll take you. Come on, will you come? Whosoever will, let him come.
Well, I know some man that's Bob Nye is closed, not going to sing anymore, but I'm going to have the piano play a couple of standards and wait just a couple of more minutes in case you're turning the thing over. If you turn over your mind, you like to come, come on. Praise the Lord, come ahead. Don't worry about it, come on. Come ahead, we'll wait for you. We're not going to sing anymore, but we'll wait for you, come on. Best way you know how. Nothing fancy. Best way you know how. You can't find it in the garbage can. Just junk in there. Just junk. Scrape that thing to the bottom. Come up, your soul just as dry and barren as the Sahara Desert. You sang your night long, my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in the sin of nature's night. The old nature's night is your birth by nature. By nature, you're born wrong. By an eye diffuse a quickening ray, the dungeon flame with light. It'll happen. Will you come? Will you come? Come on. Several down here have come. Will you come? Anywhere in the building. We'll wait about two more minutes by the clock, then we're going to close. Anybody else? I don't ever give long invitations. You know what to do. Come on. Come on. He said, Brother Robin, I'm 40 or 50 years old. It's too late to get started. It's never too late to get started. If you start, you keep messing around after a while, you won't be able to start. But God has spoken your heart tonight, some of you. You ought to come. All right, brother. Keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. I wonder if you know somebody here tonight that's not saved. If you do, step over there and ask him to come. If you're here and you're not saved, don't, don't be offended if somebody asks you to. We're concerned about you. Just ask him to come, offer to walk forward with him. Just, just a moment here. Maybe you know someone that needs to come. And they might be waiting on you to show enough concern about them to step out and come. Just ask them and come on. Anyone like that? Father, we thank Thee for what we've seen and heard and I pray that Thou wilt use it in our lives. Thank Thee for the wonderful, wonderful things we have in Christ. And uh, thank Thee we know that world has nothing to offer that's of any value. And I pray, Lord, that if there's any here that's not saved, Thou give them the conviction and the uh, desire to do something about their eternal salvation. I ask it in Jesus' name.